Hi there, my name is Sebastian Straub and I'm the Principal Solutions Architect at N2WS. In this video, I'd like to show you a new feature in N2WS Backup and Recovery version 4.1, Immutable Backups, S3 Object Lock. This is a great new feature that allows you to create a completely safe and secure backup vault, which cannot be compromised, not even by a root admin user of the AWS account. First, any S3 archiving function within N2WS Backup and Recovery requires that you already have a backup of the N2WS solution itself. I'm talking about the built-in CPM data policy. If you haven't done that yet, I suggest you pause this video and review the CPM data policy video first. If you're still with me, great, let's get started. Here in the backup monitor, you can see the policy which I've been using to backup one of my Linux instances. And now I would like to make use of the archiving capability and at the same time, I'd like to use this archive and make it super secure. So I'm choosing immutable backups. First, we need to create an S3 bucket to store the data in. If you're already using the S3 archiving feature from a previous version, you will need to change the S3 storage repository configuration. We must create a new S3 bucket for this purpose because regular S3 buckets are different from immutable buckets. Let me take you through this process. I'm gonna to switch to my AWS console, and this is the region where I'd like to create my bucket in. I'm gonna click on Create Bucket. I'm gonna choose North Virginia because that's where I want to create that archive. Now I need to give it a name. Keep in mind S3 buckets are globally unique, which means if somebody else already chose that name, you can choose it again. The next thing is we have to choose ownership. I'm gonna keep ACLs disabled because we're gonna perform the permissioning through the N2WS backup and recovery product itself. Next, we also want to make sure that public access is disabled. I don't want anybody else accessing this bucket. And luckily, this is already a default setting anyway. The next part, and this is where it gets different from the regular archiving capability in previous versions, the bucket versioning needs to be enabled. So that is a different setting from previous uh, versions. The next thing is the default encryption. We want to turn that on. I'm just gonna go with the Amazon S3 managed keys. Then under advanced settings, you can turn on the object lock. So that's, that's what's going to make that bucket immutable. So make sure to turn that on. There are some more features that we're gonna configure in a moment, but for now, this is going to serve us well. Now I also need to acknowledge that what object lock means and that I'm okay with that. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and create that bucket and I'm in luck, nobody has chosen that name before, so there it is. Now this additional configuration that I managed, uh, that I mentioned, you can then access that through the bucket details. So if I'm gonna click on that, it's gonna take us directly to that particular bucket. Versioning is turned on. And what we need is a little bit further down as we keep scrolling to the bottom. And this is what we're looking for, the object lock. So object lock is turned on, but retention is currently disabled. Well, that's not gonna help us much, so we do want to configure that. So I'm gonna click on edit. So now we're gonna change that default retention. I'm gonna turn it on. And now there's two different features and you can take a look at the AWS configuration as well. And there's two settings, governance and compliance. And for all intents and purposes, governance means that still certain admins have the ability to override and delete data in that bucket. Compliance means absolutely nobody can override or delete data in it. So for my purposes to create a completely secure data vault, which will also protect me from ransomware attacks, I'm gonna choose compliance. That message that you're seeing here in compliance mode, an object is immutable until its retention data has passed. Well, that's exactly what we want. Now I get to choose for how long do I want to make this bucket absolutely immutable. Keep in mind, not even a root admin can overwrite this. So really give this some thought for how long you want to retain the data. In my particular case, I'm gonna make it pretty short. I'm only gonna make it for 14 days. And then I'm gonna save the changes. There you go. 
And this is also the reason why we needed that bucket versioning, because bucket versioning is necessary in order to use object lock. So now we have a bucket which we can use for archiving. Let's switch back to our console. Here on the left side of the screen, that's where we have storage repositories. That's where we're going to define that S3 bucket to be able to be used. So I'm going to click on new S3 repository. Here I can give it a friendly name. This doesn't have to be the bucket name, but it can be if you want it to be the bucket name. You can also give it a description which user will be able to access this bucket to store data in. In my case, that's my root admin user. And of course, the AWS account. Again, that's my primary account. And then it will automatically show us which buckets are available. So all I have to do is look for that bucket that we created. There it is. I'm going to select that. And now I also have to instruct N2WS Backup and Recovery, the solution itself, that this is indeed an immutable bucket. And the way I do this, it's laughably easy. All I have to do is just simply tick box immutable backups. Now I'm going to click on save. So now I created a storage repository, which is indeed immutable. And you can see this also over here in this column. We're not quite there yet. N2WS Backup and Recovery is an extremely lean solution. It is a backup solution, which, well, most of the time does nothing because it just waits for backups to occur or recoveries to occur. So anything that's not related directly to a backup, we perform that using worker configurations, temporary instances which we spin up for the express purpose of creating these different configurations, such as archiving into an S3 bucket or file and folder level recovery, which is also explained in a different video. So what we need now is we also need to create a worker configuration, which will be used by the product to spin up that temporary worker instance in order to perform the actual archiving process into that bucket. We'll find this worker configuration from one below the storage repositories. I'm going to click on new. And now I can define this configuration. Again, that's my user, my root admin user my primary AWS account, and the region where I want to create the configuration in. This is essentially where the archiving is going to occur. In my case, that's North Virginia. So I'm going to select that. Next, you can now configure all of the other settings of this particular instance. I can choose a key pair to be used. If I ever feel the need to SSH into that machine, that's what I would need. However, it is not necessary for the archiving process itself. I always like to give myself that option. So what I'm going to do is I'll choose that key pair. Now, the next thing is I'm going to choose the VPC that I want to use. Now, this is a VPC which has direct communication access to the VPC that's also being used for the N2WS backup and recovery server. And the configuration needs to be able to talk through port 443 and port 22. So that's the VPC I'm going to choose. Next, I can choose my security group. In my case, I'm using the default. And then I have to choose my subnet as well. And I'll find this in here as well. That's the subnet that I want to use. Last but certainly not least, I also have the option to choose which kind of network access I want to use, direct or by an HTTP proxy. I don't use a proxy, so I'm going to leave this on direct. Next, I also have the option here now to hit the Save button. And here's my configuration now. If you have the requirement to have these workers, these temporary workers, spin up with specific tags, you can define these tags over here. And last but not least, you probably want to run a quick test. So I have my configuration selected. I'm going to click on Test. Here I can choose all of the different configurations that will be tested. Well, the one I need for sure is the S3 endpoint test because I want to use this configuration to spin up temporary workers in order to perform the archiving into S3. Generally, I always leave these tagged. Run test, and the configuration is now underway. You can click on test status, and it's in progress.
So now all of my tests have been successful, which is great. That's exactly what I want. And now I'm good to go to perform the actual configuration of my archiving and my immutable backups. For that purpose, we're gonna switch now to the policies. And that is the policy that I want to archive. That's my Linux uh, policy. I'm gonna click on edit. And as you can see, I'm performing daily backups. So that's my Linux instance that I'm backing up. I'm not performing a DR, but I do want to perform an archive, so I'm going to switch to lifecycle management. This is where it gets interesting, because within my lifecycle management, I can define how long do I want to hold on to this data. All the way at the top, this is where you're going to find for how long we're going to hold on to the native backup generations. Keep in mind, those are snapshots. The big advantage of snapshots is they're super fast. Only problem with snapshots is they're also super expensive. Well, not all data needs to be available within seconds. So there's probably some thought to be done about, well, how quickly do I need to get to what type of data for how long? I would say that my personal experience shows that hardly anybody ever says, I want this server to be exactly in the state it was in 27 days ago. If something bad happens, it probably happens within the last few days. Everything past that point is truly an archive, and we only need to get to this every once in a while. So the first thought you might want to have is, well, how long do I want to keep the data available within seconds as a snapshot? Now, in my case, I think I'm going to make this 14 days, just to be on the safe side. Now, the next portion is, this is where I'm going to turn on the archiving itself. It's this toggle box, backup to S3. So I'm going to turn that on. There's a couple more things here. This is a very interesting feature as well. It's the zero EBS snapshot feature. We're going to have a video just on that. But suffice it to say, for now, this allows us not to retain snapshots at all and just simply archive everything. Now, I can also choose, well, how often do I want to perform an archive? What I'm going to do is I want my weekly backup to be my archive. So I'm going to keep two weeks worth of backups because, as you've seen in my policy details, I'm performing daily backups. So every seventh backup, I want that to be archived into S3. Here I can choose, well, how long do I want to keep this data in S3? This can be done by generations or time or combination of the two. Now, in my case, I want to keep it simple. I want to keep it easy. So I'm only going to do this by time. And I'm going to keep my archive backups for one month. So that means my weekly backups, four of them, are going to be kept for one month. If I keep scrolling to the bottom, I can also choose to archive this data further into Glacier. This is where I can really save some money because it allows me to store the data either in Glacier or Deep Archive Glacier. But for this purpose, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep scrolling. And here, this is where I choose my S3 repository. Remember at the beginning when we defined our S3 bucket and we defined our S3 repository? Well, this is where you're going to find this. So in this drop down, and this is the storage repository that we defined. So I'm going to select that. And now here I have the choice between which S3 storage class do I want to use in this bucket. And for S3, there's three options. Standard. Well, standard is already really good because that's going to allow me to save 50% of storage cost because standard S3 is exactly half the cost of EBS snapshots. Infrequent access, well, that's going to be even more interesting because it allows me to save even more money. It's about a 75% savings. The only difference here is that infrequent access means that I need to retain the data for at least 30 days. And I also shouldn't be accessing the data unless I really have to. And then there's going to be an additional charge. But you can look that up on the AWS website as well. Intelligent tiering is interesting as well because it does allow you to use infrequent access. However, the access uh, uh, cost isn't as uh, strict as it is with infrequent access. So it's like frequent access. But again, there is another uh, storage cost associated with that as well. 
So for my purposes, I'm just going to use a standard S3, which is already going to allow me to save about 50% of storage cost. And because we made that bucket immutable, I'm going to have my immutable backups stored in S3. All I have to do now at this point is just click on the Save button. And then my policy has been updated. I'm pretty sure you're just as excited as I am to try this out. My policy is already selected. So the next part I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Run ASAP. Yes, I want to do this right now. And we can follow this in the backup monitor as well. So let's click on that. It's going to take us to that process. And we're seeing that the backup is currently being performed. So once the backup has finished, and you're going to see a green check mark right here where it says successful. Now the lifecycle status is going to kick in because now it's storing the data in S3. Eventually, that blue icon is going to turn into a green icon, and now my data is also stored in S3. And what's even better is that the data is now stored in an immutable form factor. If you ever need to recover that data, so I can click on this uh, backup set in the backup monitor, I can click on recover. Then what you're going to find up here is where is this data going to come from that we're restoring? So I can either restore from my snapshot or I can also choose my S3 repository to recover from. One of the really nice things of recovering from an S3 repository is that I can recover the data into any region. So unlike my snapshots, where the snapshot has to reside in the region where we're going to perform the recovery into, recovering from an S3 repository then affords me that freedom to recover in any region. Well, I hope you found this useful and thank you for joining me and I hope to see you in the next video.